few years after Carr died and I had my own company going, I kept being haunted by these ideas of the uh, energized flywheel, the, uh, the various uh, devices of car, and I decided to investigate them on my own very seriously because I now have the wherewithal to do so. So I started with a very simple arrangement which was in fact an embodiment that was suggested in a Tesla article called the rotation of the moon. And this was the only article Tesla ever published that was given enormous fanfare and not only that, but it was in three consecutive monthly um, publications, I forget what magazine it was in, uh, Century Magazine, I think it was, in which he describes and supports mathematically his contentions that the moon does in fact rotate. But it does so in a very peculiar manner in which <laughs> one revolution of the moon coincides with one rotation around the Earth. And that's the reason why we only see one side of it. If it wasn't rotating and it went around the, the Earth, you'd see all sides of the moon. And I kept racking my brain saying, oh, what the heck does it matter? What is this guy so preoccupied with this moon thing for when his deal was electromagnetics? <laughs> so I started looking for an anomaly because I figured if Tesla's supporting it with all that vigor, there must be something there. And this uh, picture here shows the first model of that that was actually energized with a motor but not allowed to turn. And what I did was I did static torque measurements uh, on the facility and I found out something very, very interesting. What I discovered was that if you make your measurements relative to the bench, you get one set of figures. If you make your measurements relative to the model, you get another set of figures. And that blew my mind, but it was certainly anomalous. So I started to figure out what the heck can that possibly mean. <laughs> and um, suddenly it dawned on me that there were several things happening which were not obvious. I went back to Carini, who had some shyster lawyer friend that has down in, <laughs> down in Florida, who had lots of money that he used to blow on Baccarat. And I said to him, look, instead of, instead of throwing your money away on that nonsense, why don't you give me 5,000 bucks? I want to build a model. So he actually did. He gave me the money. I built this model, which is very curious, because it's set up the same way as a Carini device, except it only has one motor. And instead of having the, uh, the, both the uh, stator and the, uh, and the armature of the motor involved in rotation, what happens is the stator is actually free to turn, but it's secured to an outer track by a ball bearing follower system. And what I found out that was interesting, even though the motor is DC, if I change the setting of that ball bearing and change its length, which changes the torque to the uh, stator torque to armature torque ratio, it actually reverses its direction without you reversing the direction of the current. Ah, says I, there are two torques involved, and there always have been, but nobody has bothered to isolate them or understand their results. And so with that in, in mind, I suddenly realized that what Tesla was trying to tell people was the secret of the magnifying transmitter and a lot of the other stuff that he was doing with real, with real power amplification resided in the fact that power is apparently relativistic. And so then I realized, since he was so hung up on Boscovich's work, that we're talking about relative motion of angular reference frames. So I started to design experiments in which I studied the effects of supplying power to unusual arrangements in which there was an orbital motion involved. And this little guy here <laughs> brings to, mar uh, brings to uh, light some very interesting results. There's a, there's a tag mark on this shaft on both ends. And yet, if you, if you turn this motor at a very low speed, this entire assembly will rotate. The interesting thing about it is, this side of the shaft makes two turns. The other side of the shaft makes one turn. It's a physical impossibility until you actually see it happen. And then, when you get into the epicyclic equations and you finally figure out what it means, what it's telling you is that the reason why power is conserved in an ordinary transmission is because of where we choose to place the prime mover. If the prime mover is placed on the axis of symmetry, I don't care what arrangement you have. Any power gain that happens to be created in the system will be destroyed when the output is brought back to the center. And then I realized, oh my God, that's what Carini was trying to accomplish with his rotating flywheel with the motors on the outside. 
And so I started to look at the whole thing in earnest, and I eventually came up with, wait a minute, we'll have to come back to that. I eventually came up with this contraption, which is the gravitational torque amplifier, and it actually puts out twice as much torque as the motors are rated for by making use of a gravitational coupling <coughs> with, the, with the earth field. Uh, now, simultaneously, while we were doing all this work, what I realized was that if there's any validity to this stuff, it should be measurable. So we started to do uh, actual work experiments in which uh, these um, exotic orbiting motor contraptions were used to do physical work. Here you see a demonstration where a four pound weight is lifted through four feet uh, and it's got a timer connected to it and a micro switch that turns off the power when the, when the work is done. And simply by changing from the orbital motor to the stationary motor, you, you can easily demonstrate a two to one ratio on the available horsepower. So uh, that was very encouraging. And then I started to apply all of these things that I learned over the years into um, distinct embodiments. This device right here is a thing that we call a transforming generator. And uh, this is on the DVD that I gave, uh, I gave to various people to uh, review. And what this does is it actually allows you to separate for the first time in a device that's uh, repeatable and measurable the difference between an EMF and a voltage. And the problem is that any time you have a winding, you wind up with two types of induction in that winding. You have LDIDT, which everybody is familiar with. That's the rate of change of current times the inductance. But you also wind up with IDLDT, which is essentially the miracle worker of these machines. And that's the, the, um, the current times the rate of change of inductance. And the reason why that's so interesting is if you do a dimensional analysis of the terms involved, it comes out to be negative resistance. And so that completes the four quadrant um, vector diagram involving watts, bars, negative bars, and negative watts. And now the whole picture starts to come together in a very succinct manner. And there's a little lab uh, in Oklahoma City where we've been playing with this stuff. And there's me and Eric at the drawing board. And what we were trying to do at this point was to say, okay, if these if these things we've discovered are true and real, let's see if there's a way to apply it to solid state circuitry in such a manner that we can secure similar results at the receiving end of the generation line rather than the source end. Because theoretically, with Thevenin's theorem, you can flip them back and forth. And so we came up with a very interesting circuit which we call SERPs, Switch to Energy Resonant Power Supply. And this device makes use of the Steinmetz reflection criteria and allows us to send power back to the source under controlled conditions in such a way that it sets the uh, actual power, not the current or the voltage, but the power into a form of oscillation. And the thing that's interesting about this is you can meter it with standard instruments and the source will show you some number like let's say 100 watts and the load will show you some number like 2000 watts. And when you look at this, naturally the tilt sign comes on if you're a standard engineer, but the truth of the matter is you're not creating energy. What you're doing is making use of the difference between net work done and absolute work done. And we have a physicist here who can help you understand the difference. Mostly it has to do with displacement and definitions. However, in the real world, it, it represents a very practical and applicable form of science. Now this device here, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on. This is a thing that we call a rotational translator and it's a very important piece of work that I did in this whole detective story because once I realized that all this stuff was possible, I kept asking myself the question, what the heck was Tesla using as his forcing function in the magnifying transmitter that could secure these results that we had seen in other applications? And so to kind of get a handle on it, I built this interesting device, which is actually powered by a DC motor here in the center. It's got an AC two-pole uh, uh, alternator on the top and a series of switching circuits on the bottom. 
And uh, this was tied into a network of impedances. And when this was rotated, um, the output signal from the AC generator was fed into a four-quadrant amplifier. The output of the amplifier was used to power the, the resistive and inductive networks. And then the waveform was looked at. And by tinkering with the settings on this, we were able to finally determine what the wave structure needed to look like in order to fulfill the Tesla magnification criteria. And then it went on to become a complete solid state apparatus, uh, which is one of the items that we're offering to Dr. Greer and his group. This is a very rare picture, but it actually comes into play in all of this. <laughs> this is uh, a picture of one of the original uh, Tesla telluric oscillators. And the reason why this is so exciting is because uh, Tesla fully understood the uh, logarithmic decrement that's associated with uh, any forcing function that's fed into a static medium and the fact that the energy dissipates logarithmically. That naturally, his own forcing function was designed to get around that. And that was the reason why he was able to create the so-called earthquake in New York back in 19, whatever it was, 1901 or 1902. And uh, so, naturally, it stands to reason that if I could do it electrically and he did it mechanically, it's a universal principle, and it's something that can be employed all over the place in any number of applications. And that's the, um, uh, the final picture of the uh, gravitational torque amplifier. So, to uh, summarize, where we stand with this now is very interesting. Uh, the work that I did on the gravitational torque amplifier demonstrated to me that uh, uh, what Tesla had actually discovered was the basic understanding of a mechanism that allows for a work amplification to be accomplished. And the work is very different from the power and it's very different from the energy. The normal standard belief is that uh, I times V is always equal to I squared R. In a linear system it's true. In a nonlinear system they're completely different numbers. Uh, the, the same um, analogy can be applied to these mechanical devices. Since these uh, slides were made, I have successfully built a very interesting and very well constructed device which allows me to demonstrate with very simple instruments and very simple um, duplicatable sources of power that you can in fact double the horsepower available from a given source simply by changing its reference frame.